welcome everyone to our marking of 20 years of spirited action for justice. I would like to begin, um, before we begin, to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. I acknowledge the original caretakers of this land on which I am, the Huron-Wendat, Patoon, Seneca, Mississaugas of the Credit, Indigenous peoples. And across this land, I acknowledge the Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Innu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to become. Honoring strength and struggle, wisdom and grief, we acknowledge and pay respects to the Indigenous nations and the ancestors of this land. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. So welcome to the Kairos Gathering, 20 years of spirited action for justice. We are so glad you are all here. What a testament to the work and the community that has grown over the past 20 years. And I'm welcoming you to the opening plenary, but it's not actually the first session. The Kairos 20 gathering began on Sunday already with an event called We Are Unstoppable. That event had storytelling, art, music, action. We signed a petition advocating for justice in Guatemala, and you might want to sign too. Beth's going to drop that link in the chat. It was an event that built links across the country and around the world. And we have more of that to do today. To guide us through each of the plenary sessions this week, I'll call on Aisha Francis. Perhaps you have read about Aisha, the new executive director at Kairos, who's been with us since May. Now is your chance to meet her, so to speak, here on Zoom. Aisha will be your host for these three plenary sessions. And so I turn it over to you now, Aisha. Thank you, Shannon, and good morning, everyone. I want to begin by welcoming you as we gather today to celebrate and commemorate 20 years of legacy for Kairos. We will begin our celebrations today with Barbara Dumont Hill. Barbara Dumont Hill is Algonquin Ashinabeg from the Kitigan Zibi community in Quebec. She has served Kairos in a variety of ways for almost 10 years. Barbara has facilitated well over 100 blanket exercises to many groups and organizations from high schools to federal government departments and the RCMP. She has served for several years as a spirit keeper for Carleton University, Algonquin College and the Public Service Alliance of Canada and the Children's Aid Society of Ottawa, among other organizations. She traveled across Canada as an advisor with the Canadian Department of Justice to witness the missing and murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry. Barbara's work has inspired her path to honor and empower Indigenous women and youth. Good morning, Barbara, we welcome you. Miigwech, Aisha. Um, what a wonderful way to start the day. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all living your life in a good way. I am a very proud Anishinaabe woman. My name is Barbara Dumont Hill. I am Turtle Clan, and I was born on the Kitiganzibi Indian Reserve. Um, congratulations, Kairos, and, and all you amazing, amazing people. Um, 10 years uh, being around you has uh, certainly inspired me to be a better human being. 
and um, I'm I'm always just so amazed with the uh, the people at at Kairos and and everything that you do on a daily basis. I uh, you know right now we're 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 getting close to the end of of the trout moon here in Algonquin territory. We're in the trout moon and we're on that waning side of 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 the full moon and. Um, you know that uh, that trout moon um, is uh, represents uh, love, hope, community, and it represents um, better times to come. And uh, you know the the uh, the water is at exactly the the, the right temperature, the best uh, temperature for that spawning of the trout. And uh, but it isn't it isn't just the water temperature that has to be right. It's it's the males and the females coming together at the right moment for those uh, for the growth of of uh, the trout um, and feeding um, many many people. And the the foundation is really important. What is at the bottom of of the lakes, the streams, uh, the oceans where where the trout would spawn, and that's how adaptable they are. There there is trout in salt water as as in our fresh water, um, you know. And uh, but but that that foundation is is so important for the growth, and um, and that's like um, justice. That is like. Uh, change for for better times to come in our country we have to have the right foundation and to me kairos is definitely the epitome of of that um creating the right foundation um not just for themselves but but for people across the world not and and uh, here in canada but 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 the whole world across the whole world, and that is that is being adaptable. It is powerful. It is um, growth that um, that creates the change and the better times to come. So that the uh, that again that trout moon, you know, it it will soon be done. But I know Kairos work. Kairos's work will not be done that quickly. There is still so much to do. And I think, um, you know, many days when, when people talk to me and they say, you know, there is no racism or there is no injustice or there is no, um, uh, it's not, is not as bad as, as, we've, as it's been made out to be. But, um, they don't, they don't know my story and they don't know the story of thousands of other people here on this land, but also across the world. The many, the much racism, the many injustices that are done on a regular basis and not only to human beings, but to our earth. And um, when we are doing injustices to our earth, uh, we are in doing injustice to human beings and how important it is for us to speak up on behalf of our earth, on behalf of the, of the, the air, the water, um, because we want better things. We want, we want our, our, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren to have at the very minimum what we had, but it really should, they should have what our great, 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 great grandparents had. And um, unless there is that good change, that cannot happen. So, um, so Kairos, again, I am so proud to be to be here to have been part of your of your community uh, for 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 ten years, and um, I I hope to be part of it for for ten more. Um, I'd like to start your day in a good way with a Thanksgiving prayer. And it's a prayer we often, uh, people, you know, we, we, we are grateful when, when we get new, pre when we get presents, when we get a new purse or new shoes, you know, we, we, we think this is the be all end all. But uh, for us indigenous, indigenous people, it was about, about the earth, 
and giving gratitude for all the gifts we were given. And uh, so we'll start with that, that prayer. So I want to say Chimigwich to Creator for bringing Kairos into our lives and to give them the strength and courage that they need to carry on with their, with their mission across the world for better life for, hum other, for human beings and for our earth. I'm grateful for everyone who is here today to listen, to learn, to create the, the good change that needs to happen. I'm grateful today for our grandfather son who shares his life with us each day and our grandmother moon who lights up our night sky and breaks down our seasons for us. I'm grateful for our sacred mother earth who provides everything we need to live our life in a good way. For the sacred air, the breath of Minomenido, for the sacred water, the blood of our mother earth that quenches our thirst, brings life into the world and reminds us that women are sacred. For the winged, the four-legged, the swimmers, the crawlers, for all the trees, the plants, the roots, the medicines that grow here on Great Turtle Island that have added beauty to our life each day and have always shared their bounty with us. I'm grateful for all the ancestors who created a good path for us all to follow. And those generations of ancestors that we all have a responsibility to leave a good path for. I'm grateful for all the people who live their life in a good way, who have respect for our mother earth and for all human beings, even if they are different than you. I ask creator to touch each one of us today to bless us with wisdom and understanding that we all belong to one creator. We all have a responsibility to respect all of her creation. So for each one of you and all of these things, I say chimigwech. Now let's have a good day of listening and uh, knowing what we need to do to create that, that change for a better tomorrow for our future generations. Chimigwech, everyone. Thank you so very much, Barbara. That was wonderful. It was absolutely beautiful and such a warm way to begin our entire sessions of gathering. So thank you so, so, so much. So let's lean into the beginnings of our 20th anniversary. The beauty of this moment is that we are all here. We are taking time to celebrate, reflect, and dream. We may further be compelled to act and I hope be moved to love. There is intention behind our three days that will give opportunity for us to be reminded of our foundation, to pay attention to the moment of now and to envision with hope a more bountiful tomorrow. I wanna take a moment right now to acknowledge and thank all of the Cairo staff. We had a lot of uh, people who are here who will be involved over the next three days uh, our staff will be participating, our staff will be contributing, our staff will be celebrating and just being uh, a part of the audience. But in the background, they have done brilliant and incredible work for many years to um, shape and form Kairos and to bring to life the vision of Kairos that was um, embedded in it when it was founded. And they have been planning for a very long time to make this come to pass. And so in this moment, I wanna take a minute to celebrate and thank our Kairos staff. We find ourselves in Kairos, a time when conditions are right for the accomplishment of a crucial action. The goal over the next three days is to take this moment to anchor us all with confidence, compassion, courage, and conviction, to be steadfast in our work and hopeful for the fruit of our labor that is to come. So welcome everyone. We are so excited for what the next three days will, will be. We're excited for the conversations we are going to have. We're excited for what's going to come out of those conversations because it's never enough for us to share our ideas and share our gifts with one another. But Every time we come together, it is a moment for us to be inspired. It is a moment for us to be encouraged. It is a moment for us to be enlightened. And it is a moment for us to 
be supported so that we can go out and do that work. We know the work is never easy, but it is always um, important. And so as we come together and as each one of us lives out our purpose um, and is looking for that fullest fulfillment of our lives, I pray that each and every one of us will get something really concrete and tangible from this uh, uh, gathering. Um, there will be opportunities for networking, so I hope that you'll meet a, a few new folks as well, and um, I welcome you all to this Kairos 20th anniversary event. Thank you for coming to celebrate with us. At this time, I would like to introduce uh, Adriana. Let me just get her. I'm in the wrong spot here, but Adriana on Contreras. She is the artist, a freelance artist who offers graphic recording, design, cultural programming, and communications. Kairos is pleased to have Adriana back for another week after she did beautiful recordings at a Global Partners Gathering last year. Adriana is going to explain a little bit about the graphic recording process now. Adriana, welcome. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm calling you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations here by the Coast Salish Sea. And I'm originally from Colombia. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here um, to be part of this celebration, to listen to the stories that will be shared today um, throughout our time together today and uh, during the upcoming plenaries, I'll be listening to the dialogue uh, and creating a visual record of our time together. Um, I'd like to think of it as a, a way of capturing some of the energy in the space, uh, planting some seeds and memories for the work that's going to come in the future. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to switch over my camera to the work that I'm doing. So throughout the session, you'll be able to see it unfolding. And um, because we um, there are so many of us on the call, it'll be little, but if you wanna see it uh, larger on the top right corner of your um, of, the, of the square where my face is right now, uh, there are three dots that you can click on and you'll see that an option shows up for pinning the image and that will allow you to, to be able to see it larger. Um, and pin and unpin throughout the call to be able to see it. And I will see each other, uh, we'll see each other later for a very brief walk, uh, walk through the image as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adriana. Okay, let's jump into the plenary for this morning. I'd like to introduce Emily Duggan, who will be our panel moderator. Emily, Emily is a minister in the United Church of Canada serving a two-point charge in Catalonia and Louisbourg, Cape Breton. She first became involved with Kairos in 2010 as a member of the Movement Building Circle, where she served as a representative of the UCC for five years. In 2019, she participated in the Kairos Atlantic Gathering and is honored to take part in celebrating 20 years of Kairos. Good morning, Emily, and welcome. I hand it over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much. I want to begin by saying that I am joining you all from the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people here in Unamagi. And um, uh, I wanted to welcome everyone and, and thank you for joining us. It is a, a true honor to be here with all of you today. The theme of our first plenary session is where we have come from. The panelists and responders represent global partners, Indigenous perspectives, and the coalitions that predate Kairos, three very important perspectives coming into Kairos. They will offer their reflections on the early stages of the movement, which shaped Kairos today, and will also help guide us into the future. I'm so excited to be here among all of you. I, I can't remember exactly when I was first introduced to Kairos, I formally became involved um, in 2010, as mentioned, but um, I know that whenever the name Kairos was mentioned in connection with a justice issue or uh, an, important, um, an important 
uh, social justice issue happening, I had the sense that it meant something important and that this was something I wanted to get behind. In my undergrad, I proudly displayed my tap into it sticker on my water bottle from that campaign. And uh, as I became more involved with the United Church Justice work, I felt the significance of the Kairos movement through, especially through the Kairos is not going away campaign. And so I'm delighted to be able to enter into this time of uh, reflection and sharing um, about where we all began. So I want to introduce our, our first panelist now, um, Yvonne Yanez, who is a founding member of an, and current president of Acción Ecologica, one of the most well-known and respected climate justice organizations in Latin America, and also Oil Watch, an oil, an oil activities resistance network. Yvonne works on energy, climate change, and more recently, environmental services. And so welcome, Yvonne. Um, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, I am going to speak in Spanish. Um, so I don't know if I leave the people to change the channel, maybe a few seconds. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Kairos and all um, our friends and partners here have um, given me the opportunity to be a part of these very important conversations. These are not only important because of um, our, our exchange of ideas that, that we will see today, but it is also important because it is the anniversary of an organization such as Kairos for Acción Ecológica and for other organizations around the world uh, plays a very important role of solidarity and um, of working together. I would like first to say hello to all of you that are here, all the people that um, work for Kairos and we have been able to work together for 20 years. It is a very interesting um, situation because from Ecuador with organization Acción Ecológica, we see that the organizations of the North don't always, um, are not empathetic enough or don't com completely understand the situation in the South. But fortunately with Kairos, it's the complete opposite. There has always been a very, um, very intimate um, relationship and in all the past that we have uh, taken together. I would like to congratulate you, Kairos, for these 20 years of hard work. It is important that we remember our sister, Gloria Chicaiza. She was a sister that we worked with for many years and we miss her. We miss her here and there. And somehow my voice is her voice saying hello to all our brothers and sisters in our in the countries of the North. She is the one that should be here speaking. At this time, I would like to remember three very important uh, moments of our work with Kairos. They're not just an anecdote, but they show how we have been able to create change, create change in the organization, but also in this um, dream that we have of creating a better world, better world for us, for the people, for the, for the children, for the animals and for the earth. We were remembering with um, the coworkers of Acción Ecológica in the year 2003, 19 years ago with Kairos, we published a small book it was a very important book and it was called No More Looting and Destruction. And we, the people of the South are ecological creditors. This book came out in 2003 and it was very important at that time. It was important because Acción Ecológica and Kairos were working together to talk about the environmental debt in the world. It was very symbolic. It was very symbolic that Cairo, coming from Canada, was coming um, with, together with us to work 
on this idea. But we were also recognizing that the industrialized countries of the North, in this case, Canada, was a country that owed something to other countries such as uh, Ecuador or countries of the South. It's been 19 years and it was a very um, important time. I would like to remind you as well um, our, of our friend John Dillon. It wouldn't have been possible to walk um, together without the help of John. I am sure that you all miss him very much and think about him every day. There was another very important moment when Kairos invited um, Acción Ecológica and a, a person from the local jungle in Ecuador to come and to meet Alberta and the Tar Sands. I remember that one of the events uh, um, that happened in Canada, they added the slogan uh, of keep the oil in the soil, they added and the tar sands in the land. This is how Oil Watch incorporated um, in, in their requests the need, if we want to think of a better world, not only to leave the oil in the soil in the south, but in the north as well. And in this point, we were referring to the tar sands. At that time, we met the campaign of Kairos Carbon Sabbath. And they, there was a document about re-energizing the carbon Sabbath. And we were talking about projects of Kairos. It was a very important time. At that time, we could see that the proposals of the South, the projects of the South were being supported by projects of the North. They aligned on this project. At that time, and in the years to come, we were very worried. We were worried in Canada on how you were suffering with a government that have, that was um, very right wing and that was also taking away many, many rights of uh, civil society. I know that you were um, suffering many problems with the government of, with the Harper government. This is something that we had to support you through. The governments, the right-wing governments, not only happened in the South, but they were also causing many problems in the North. Remember clearly the situation that uh, Kairos was living at the time. Many years went by and many gatherings as well. In the last 10 years, maybe one of the um, most uh, important contributions um, that we were able to do together was um, with regards to women and extractivism. And I remember in July of 2019, Gloria was um, had a very delicate health and she was invited once more by Kairos to give a voice in the meeting for the Committee on Human Rights in Canada. Many times she was scared. She was scared even to cough while she was speaking. She was... Um, sharing the situation of women in Ecuador and in Latin America with this beautiful work. And they were being um, affected by extractivism, the women. She was able, for example, to see, she was able to see um, the, the blanket exercises that took place. And that is how um, she was able to work with other people from Kairos and started to think about the possibility of carrying out exercises such as this one in Ecuador. And that's how later on we were able to carry these out in, when Gloria was still around. All these exchanges were also complemented with um, visits of um, brothers and sisters from Kairos in Ecuador. They visited areas that were affected by mining and by um, oil, and they went to different areas of the jungle to see this. These exchanges between the North and the South and this strategy of um, exchange has been really powerful. It's been able. It's been able to help us to um, close take a close look at what's happening in our countries. We have walked with Kairos hand in hand. It's not just international cooperation. 
um, exclusively. Kairos for us has been an, a sister organization in which we have been able to walk um, shoulder to shoulder and we have been able to do it for a better world. I am sure that this will continue for 20 more years. As the name says, Kairos, Kairos will always be there and we will always work together at the um, um, at the right moments when organizations from north and the south will need it. Congratulations to Kairos and thank you for everything and for the memory of our brother John and our sister Gloria, Acción Ecológica. They are here, they are present. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yvonne, for sharing and, and offering such a, a passionate uh, testament to your experience with, uh, with Kairos. I would like to now introduce our next panelist, uh, Priscilla Solomon. She is an Ojibwe member of the Anishinaabeg Nation and a sister of St. Joseph of Sault Ste. Marie. She has worked in the Faith and Justice Office of her congregation since 1998. The current focus of her work is reconciliation between people of settler origins and Indigenous people. She has been connected in various ways with Kairos since it began. And I would like to now welcome Priscilla as our next panelist. Bojo, Indishnikaz Ogimakwe. Indodem Makwa. Uh, my spirit name is Ogi Makwe, and uh, I am from the Bear Clan, and my mother is of the Deer Clan. I'm uh, I'm honored and and uh, pleased to be a part of this uh, anniversary celebration, and grateful for the invitation to reconnect with uh, people that I haven't been in touch with for a while, and it's just good to see these faces again, to see your faces. Uh, so my um, my thoughts about my experience in Kairos and Kairos itself on this anniversary celebration, it's been a journey. That was the first thought that I had was we've been on a 20 year journey and it's a journey with very significant moments and events uh, with a lot of Kairos moments, big ones and little ones. And uh, I share from the perspective of an Indigenous person in how Indigenous people have been involved in Kairos and how Kairos has been involved with Indigenous people. Uh, I was thinking too, it's not just a journey, it's a pilgrimage. Uh, a pilgrimage is really a journey of faith. And we have been people of faith journeying together over these past 20 years and people of faith journey even before that in the coalitions. So in an ecumenical uh, way, so as, as people of faith on a pilgrimage, I was in France in 2011 and I had the opportunity to be on a pilgrimage there. And one of the things that was pointed out was the shell symbol that's on various buildings and places all along the pilgrimage and pilgrims journeying to the Holy Land or whatever shrine they were traveling to would look for this shell symbol and where the shell symbol was, where they found it, they knew that they were on the right path and they knew that they would have support, they would have friendship, they would have food, they would have what they would have their needs met. So in many ways, that's what this journey with Kairos has been. There have been many uh, signs and many symbols that tell us we're on the right path. The path that's led by the spirit, God's spirit, and the path that is one of faith and hope and, and, uh, and trust. And certainly that's been called forth from all of us. So, um, and in doing that, we're, we're living out Christ's call to welcome the stranger. So as I thought about this, uh, kind of looking back into the past, I thought about uh, Kairos 
starting off with 11 different uh, coalitions, as you know, and one of which was the Aboriginal Rights Coalition. And uh, I recall when and when Kairos was first established, there was a real concern on the part of the staff to, in, to ensure that none of the members of those 11 coalitions felt left out or felt like their ministry was being left out. So there was a real effort at the very beginning to make sure that uh, the work that those different groups were doing was incorporated into Kairos. Uh, but it couldn't go on with that many different organizations within the one. So there were priorities established and there were about six priorities with, with the communications one established as well. And uh, over the years, over these 20 years, there have been a, there's been a lot of restructuring. <clears throat> and uh, it, we still have uh, five different priorities uh, that gather the work of Kairos. So the priorities may have been renamed or restructured, but the ministry of Kairos remains. Um, and in that, in that journey, in that pilgrimage, we've been looking for the signposts. So I, I thought about what are the signposts in the Indigenous ministry? And one of them was that right at the very beginning, in 2001 or 2002, I was invited by the newly established Kairos staff, and uh, two of the people that were on staff then were uh, Jennifer Henry and, uh, and Sarah Stratton. And they invited me to come to the Kairos office and do a presentation on Indigenous spirituality because they had no experience of it and they had no knowledge of it, but they knew that ARC was a part of Kairos and that they wanted to learn more. So certainly since then, much has changed from that lack of awareness, from the recognition of a need for awareness to where we are today in these 20 years later. The, uh, when the Aboriginal rights, when the, when Kairos was established, the Aboriginal rights office was in Ottawa and it remained there. And in some ways, as I journeyed through with Kairos in this time, I, there was a period of time when I felt like, uh, the Aboriginal rights was left out, left out of the picture. Everything was happening in Toronto. And in some ways that was necessary because of the, the restructuring and the organization being centered there. But um, I realized later that it wasn't as totally left out as it appeared to me. In the restructuring, the Aboriginal Rights Coalition became the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle in one of those restructuring. And uh, that circle became an important circle in the journey of Kairos. Uh, in 2000, in, uh, between 2001 and 2011, I was involved with Kairos through the CRC, uh, that's the Canadian Religious Conference, the Ontario Kairos Group. And during that time, Ed Bianchi came to Toronto to one of the CRC Kairos meetings and presented the blanket exercise. That raised awareness among the religious members present, religious congregations, of the need for uh, kind of looking at our history and recognizing there is not just the one story of how Canada has developed. There's also a whole Indigenous perspective to which Barbara made reference this morning, our stories. So that awareness was raised. And I also recognized that uh, during that time in 2005, 2006, there was a campaign uh, titled Water, a Sacred Gift. And that's an Indigenous perspective. So it wasn't totally absent from Kairos. 
and uh, in 2010 and 2011, there was another campaign on the land, our life, Indigenous rights, and our common future. So for me, the, the signs are there that Kairos has been engaged with Indigenous uh, peoples, and that engagement has grown over the years. So one of, for me, one of the most significant moments in the, in the relationship has, was in 2011. Uh, I had just been uh, asked by the CRC Ontario group to be the Indigenous representative on the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle. And following the pattern of uh, ARC, the circle met in various uh, locations across the country, but always on in an Indigenous community or near an Indigenous community. And it was Ontario's time to host it. So uh, I agreed to host it in North Bay. And that meeting in North Bay became for me a turning point in the relationship. <clears throat> the uh, Kairos staff came to the meeting. They had prepared the... Um, campaign for the year, and they had prepared a five-year plan. And uh, they came not only as staff and two board members, uh, Paul Garrett and uh, Henriette Thompson, came with Ed, and uh, I don't remember who the other staff members were, but there were some invited guests from some of the other circles as well, because they were wondering how does this Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle function. It functioned in a somewhat different way from the other circles, it seemed. So they all came to, the, to North Bay for that meeting. And during the meeting, Kairos presented the five-year plan and the uh, campaign for the year. But there was real dissatisfaction among the Indigenous members of the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle and some unease. So we began a conversation, a discussion at the meeting. And during the discussion, Ray Jones expressed a concern that it felt like the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle members were simply being asked to rubber stamp a plan that the, the staff had prepared. And uh, It wasn't what the Indigenous members wanted. We did not want to just rubber stamp somebody else's plan. One of the Indigenous members in the circle said very, very strongly, I think it was Harley, he said, um, we don't want campaigns and programs. We want a relationship. And... Uh, I think that was the first time that that was really clearly articulated in Kairos, that the Indigenous members in Kairos want a relationship with Kairos. And after a lot of discussion and conversation, I realized that we were, what we were trying to say was we needed Kairos to work with Indigenous people, not for us. And that was a real shift in consciousness. That's what the group was expressing. So the, uh, it was a Kairos moment because the staff and the board members present really heard that message and recognized that a change was needed. The, uh, <coughs> the meeting put us on a new path. The small committee was established or created to strategize on how to educate the board and the staff about developing a new kind of partnership relationship with the, uh, with the Indigenous people. And uh, again, I think it was Paul Gares and Henriette for the board members on that committee and Harley Eagle and myself were the Indigenous members. Ed Bianchi was uh, staff, and uh, Jennifer Henry came at different times as part of staff to do that, that work. And uh, 
we went, we met for several months trying to clarify what was this need and what was the new kind of relationship that we wanted to see developed. And uh, <clears throat> one of the results was that the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle was invited to present at an annual meeting uh, what our concerns were and what our approach was. And then we were, our circle members were invited to sit with the other four circle members at, at tables to converse with them. And one of the things that happened was that certainly there was an interest in what we were trying to say, but there, was also, there were also a couple of situations where the conversation raised awareness about an unconscious racism that existed among some of the Kairos members. At the beginning of Kairos, there was no real uh, general awareness of internalized racism or of, of uh, systemic racism that was being acknowledged in Canada. And uh, I think this uh, initiative, this relationship that we were building within Kairos was helping us to uh, become more aware of that and certainly to work to overcome it. So uh, a lot of significant changes have happened since that, uh, that meeting. That's why I think it was a key moment in Kairos. The, uh, Kairos itself was very, very engaged in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and doing education blanket exercises during the education days in each of the locations. Uh, it's almost impossible to say how much was accomplished during that period of time in raising awareness within, not only within Kairos, but within the churches about the need for engagement with Indigenous people and the need for reconciliation. I think another uh, piece that came out of that was the, uh, the development within Kairos, and I think Jennifer Henry probably had a lot to do with this, um, but the board did too, and the staff did, but the development of a sense of allyship. That's working with not for, and that sense of allyship is much, much stronger today than it was 15 years ago, or even 10 years ago. I think another difference that I see is the, the number of Indigenous faces, the number of Indigenous people that Kairos has engaged as, uh, as partners in individual events, particularly in the development of the blanket exercise and the leadership in the blanket exercise, that all of those uh, kind of Kairos moments of inviting one or another Indigenous person enabled people to become aware of the need to shift the relationship between Indigenous peoples in Canada and peoples of settler origins, to shift us into uh, a better awareness of the need for reconciliation and of paths that we can take to move forward in reconciliation. So uh, certainly the work of reconciliation is uh, still very much needed today and Kairos still has a very strong role in that work. And. Uh, the development of the blanket exercise from before Kairos right through the history of Kairos and the, the significance of the blanket exercise in the Kairos organization is testament to the desire to change the relationship and to bring about a new reality in this country. So thank you very much. That's, uh, there were other things that I can't recall at the moment that I was going to say, but thank you. Thank you so much, Priscilla, for sharing your story and, and highlighting the, the importance of, of that piece of relationship building and, uh, and where it has, has brought us uh, through the years to today. 
I'd like to introduce our next panelist at this time, uh, Lee Cormy. He has been a researcher, teacher, writer, and sometime activist concerning liberation theologies, just social justice movements, and church social teachings since the 1970s, connecting with grassroots activism. He is an associate professor emeritus of the Faculty of Theology, University of St. Michael's College, and the Toronto School of Theology. So welcome, Lee. First, my deep appreciation for the invitation to participate with you all in remembering this rich past and imagining uh, our future together. I have a confession to make from the beginning, and it's only been the need for it has been intensified by my predecessors this morning, by Barbara in particular and her wonderful prayer of opening, and by Ivone and her recollection about connection and growing solidarity between Canadian groups, coalitions in Kairos, and uh, Ecuadorian groups and organizations. By Priscilla and her remembering the history of uh, Indigenous people and their involvements in the coalitions and coming forward in Kairos and systems that so much has been accomplished. So what happens every time I have an opportunity like this, I'm stimulated, of course, has something to do with age maybe, uh, memories that go back far into the past and then come alive once again in the present. So I'm limited in my time, but I have a lot more to say uh, by way of re recounting incidents and events and people and places. I do want to remember in particular, as Boni did, John Dillon, and I want to add also John Mihalis, John Mihalik, um, both of whom died way before their time and had already made immense contributions. To the, to the journey along the path of the spirit that we're talking about. So these mem memories echo and, and I wanna honor them and carry as many of them forward with me as I can in this presentation, but of course I can't, I can't do all of them. So let me just suggest some key moments and defining features of this story as I have experienced it. I'll begin with the creation of the coalitions in the 1970s and early 80s. And at the risk of uh, challenging Priscilla, uh, my count of the coalitions is 13. Uh, but by different definitions, maybe some get included and some don't. In any case, they erupted in the 1970s uh, in, in a time of extraordinary uh, and fertility, creativity, fertility, fertility. Let me just list them as I have reconstructed the list. The Canada China program, 10 Days for Global Justice, the Ecumenical Coalition for Economic Justice, originally GAPFLY, the Inner Church, Interchurch Action for Development, Relief, and Justice, originally the Interchurch Fund for International Development, PLURA, the Inner Church Project on Population, the Aboriginal Rights Coalition, originally ARC, or originally Project North. The Task Force on Churches and Corporate Responsibility, Project Plowshares, the Canada Asia Working Group, the Interchurch Committee on Human Rights in Latin America, the Interchurch Committee for Refugees, the Interchurch Coalition for Africa. This extraordinary proliferation of initiatives and, and issues and constituencies and critical discourses. How do we understand the, the issues that are being addressed? And of uh, creativity and experimentation in, in organizational format. How do we come together? How do we marshal support for this? Uh, where can we find uh, allies in going forward? There were countless successes in the, in the history of these groups, I wish to affirm, uh, in the spirit of Priscilla's testimony to the uh, Aboriginal rights and Yvonne's uh, reflection about the ac axiom ecologica and Kairos. I wish we had more time to talk about the successes. I think progressive people, people on the left generally don't talk enough about successes. 
Meanwhile, of course, as the world was changing in other ways, there were huge developments in science and technology and all kinds of processes of globalization on the way, linking the world ever more intensely on ever more fronts uh, and changing the way we each experience the world. Leaping ahead again, unfortunately. But meanwhile, in the same period, in the, starting in the 70s, certainly in the 80s at the latest, there was a backlash against these, these initiatives and these kinds of movements and organizations. Thatcher in Great Britain, Reagan in the United States, Mulroney in Canada, and fast forwarding to Harper, who, who you've only represent, who mentioned. There was a, a project of globalization called globalization or neoliberal globalization, talked about in terms by many in Latin America, or neoliberal slash neoconservative globalization. Anyway, it emerged in opposition to these groups and with another agenda for the future of the world. At the same time, the tensions and conflicts in the churches were growing as well. Uh, Gregory Baum wrote in 1991, for example, in my judgment, the present is a time of mourning. The period beginning with the 60s was experienced by the church as a kairos, a special time when major social change towards greater justice was a historical possibility. In his judgment, he said then, 1991, this kairos is over. We now live in the wilderness. And retrenchment is the order of the day. Fast forward again. So from the early 90s in the sense of a winter time of social justice activity to the mid and late 1990s when there was so stirring again a resurgence of social movements around the world really quite extraordinary. And the Canadian Ecumenical Jubilee Initiative emerges in this time as a response. And the sense that there was a worldwide transition underway and that we needed to be addressed in global terms and uh, both in terms of our ideas, our understanding, but also our network. Let me quote from the Telegram's vision statement. I wanted to cite the, the Jubilee uh, vision statement, which was forged in launching the Jubilee Initiative uh, and published. It's a beautiful statement. I urge you to find a PDF version of it. Uh, it's inspiring and beautiful in many ways. From that statement, the conclusion of it, Christians have not always announced the reign of God without distortion, without colonial misinterpretations of others' beliefs, especially those of indigenous people without participation in social structures that did not benefit all peoples and the earth. Christian theologies have often justified the vision of infinite unidimensional growth and de development, so destructive to the wider community of life on earth. So we ask ourselves, what would make the Jubilee a true celebration for all? The symbol of Jubilee is the symbol of the new millennium, especially the impoverished, the outcasts, the slaves, the disinherited. Celebrations of Jubilee or marking of the year 2000, we should not address yesterday's wrongs, seek new approaches to overcoming today's problems, and celebrate faith as a commitment to social justice and economic logical renewal. Uh, ones that do not address, do not address those issues, are little more than a gong booming or a symbol clashing. Our biblical tradition inspires a vision to renew ourselves our social structures, and our earth. There's so much to say about the organizational initiatives and creativity of the Jubilee Initiative, which is not space to do here, but it would be lovely to hear about it in, in along the lines of the structural change and the restructurings that this Earl was talking about in terms of ARC and the Aboriginal Rights Coalition in particular. So by on the end of the Jubilee Initiative came, uh, occurred and the launching, the restructuring and launching of Kairos happened. Now, unfortunately, there's no time to talk about all of this here. So let's fast forward to the, to the current situation. <clears throat> So 
So now, 20 years later, after the birth of Kairos, it's clear that the scope of human agency, more accurately, the scope of some humans, is expanding to truly godlike scales. An Israeli historian, Yuval Harari, coins the term homo deus, godlike human, to signify the emergence of this new kind of, what should we say, melded God human being on the face of the earth. There are many great science and technological advances uh, fueling dreams of a new heaven on earth, from anti-COVID vaccines to nanotech, biotech, infotech, cognotech, enhanced transhumanities, which are arguably already emergent in many places in the world. And many people, many scientists and techn technologists envision in the, in the near future, in the few, next few decades, the emergence of post-human successor species. Uh, many, many people might recognize the emergence of uh, the blurring of lines between science fiction and reality in, in Canadian actor, actor William Shatner, Captain Kirk of Spy, Star Trek, his journey from being an actor and acting science fiction stories to a passenger on a ship that goes to the edge of space. Extraordinary transition from fiction to reality in really in an incredibly short time and opening up frontiers that are hard to imagine. A final word. In the midst of all of this in, in the last 20 years and certainly today on the way around the world, there's an extraordinary religious resurgence it's not that any tradition has the answers to the questions of the earlier periods or the questions today, but, but the kinds of questions are, have been asked before, the kinds of issues have been wrestled with before, the kinds of resolutions of some of those issues can inspire us today. So there is a biblical symbol that captures this sensibility. It was important to us in the, in the Jubilee Initiative a symbol of, of apocalypse. And let me cite one source for rethinking this notion of apocalypse. Uh, I'm citing John Mohawk, a Seneca born into the Turtle Clan on the Cataraugus Indian Reservation in what's now Western New York State. He was a primary author of a, of, of a basic call to consciousness, the classic collected work of the Haudenosaunee Grand Council from the mid 1970s on the meaning of traditionalism as a guide to political activism. In his view, apocalypse was not merely a myth of the far distant end of the cosmos at the end of time, which some astronomers now talk about as the big crunch. Rather, he insisted, referring to a particular Hopi myth of civilizational death and rebirth, quote, this story should not be thought of as a fantasy, but as a collective memory. The archaeological and geological records show that past civilizations did exist in the desert southwest of the present day US. They did decline and disappear, and the people did reappear. The story is true. So, in conclusion, let me say let us all say that we learn from indigenous peoples, especially to see more clearly that the story of resurrection, rebirth, renewal is unfolding again, again in our time, and this time on planetary, perhaps even cosmic scales. Let's pray too that Kairos and related communities and movements join in their rich legacies continue to grow in their capacities to nurture insight, solidarity, hope, and faith, which sustains us all against such great odds. Amen. And thank you very much. We thank you so much for sharing your reflections with us today. So we'll now move to, to hearing from our responders as they share their thoughts from what they've heard of our panelists and, and lift up any of the um, important things they want to highlight from this. The, the first responder we will hear from is Georgine um, Kenjne Dejutain and I apologize if I pronounced your name incorrectly. 
Uh, she is an economist. She received a Master of Philosophy in Economic Science. She is trained on project management, monitoring and evaluation, conflict resolution, gender and human rights, lobby and advocacy. And she is now working as program coordinator with the African Gender and Extractive Alliance, Women, based in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa. So welcome, uh, Georgine. Thank you very much, Emily. It's a pleasure and a satisfaction being with you as we are all celebrating uh, Kairos 20 years of great work. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate the staff of uh, Kairos and we'll also think about uh, John Delon and also John Mihev, and also thinking of um, Jim Davis with whom we worked uh, for a very long time. So I have listened with great uh, interest and that was really very inspiring. Um, the message and a passionate experience of Johnny, the speaker brought forth during this uh, conversation and also sharing the experience they had at the, the work they did together with Kairos. What uh, caught my attention basically is the fact that uh, we started, and that was really very important, they started by pointing out that Kairos, even if it is a moment, a very important moment, Kairos laid a foundation, and that was a very strong foundation in the world who really needed that foundation at least to start addressing these issues of injustices that was um, prevailing in the world. And what is really very important is that if that foundation wasn't strong, the wind will blow and scatter everything. But if Kairos has resisted 20 years and will and still contemplating more years to come is because the foundation was really very strong. And I was really very much touched uh, with the clear vision and also the vision of change that was at place and basically the world they want to see. What is really very much interesting was also how Kairos wanted basically to achieve that goal and to see that change. They went through, uh, they explore what I we will call here and what, um, Yvonne, I also had the opportunity to work with, was also sharing with us. Like they looked at uh, the women in um, extractivism. And we know that women in extractivism issues were not brought forward. And when we were speaking about violence against women in the world, that issues wasn't raised. We were seeing the issues of violations on the women's rights, basically, at the public fears, and when we are also talking about the number of parliamentarians we may have in countries. But Kairos went deep in to look at what we are really talking about injustice and also the ecological debt and also the destruction of ecology or our environment we are suffering today because of that, but they raised their voice with the partner. And I was happy when Lee was talking about, you know, the allyship together. So the Kairos was not speaking on behalf of the marginalized community. Kairos was speaking with the community and bringing their issues forward. From my experience as well, I was coming and we are still coming from the, from the background where, and 20 years back, um, 
with good intention, some of our partners in the North were speaking about our issues, but we were never there. We were never given opportunity to say what we are living, how we are affected by the injustices we are living and how we are feeling or what could be our vision in changing the world. But Kairos was one of the organization who gave strength, direction and supported communities to bring their issues forward and to speak by themselves. So this was clearly uh, uh, brought forward with our three panelists. Like they were invited, part participants or communities were invited and were speaking on their own behalf. And uh, this was very important because most, uh, most of our decision-making uh, leaders, sometimes they are speaking from a very professional room where they do not have understanding of what is happening on the ground. And we also know that NGOs may represent some participants, some communities, but they are not the communities. They are not living what communities are living and are affected. And this is really very much appreciated. And we will continue to stress on that. And uh, Lee pointed it out that even if there are some issues were affecting us and we are coming from a Christian, pers sorry, a faith perspective, some of us are Christians and some of us have their own spirituality. The issue of oneness is very much, you know, embedded in those spiritualities. And what is also very important was to acknowledge what we are doing wrong and how we can correct it. So we are facing racism, exploitation in the world, but I'm seeing I'm working with Kairos from the North, not operating as others in the North, not thinking as others in the North, but thinking like us, working with us to bring the change we want uh, to see. And it's also very um, good. And some of the things uh, Priscilla brought in, you know, was really very important, the work of reconciliation. And that work of reconciliation is not only within Kairos, it was also out of Kairos. I worked in the community where I had, with the support of uh, Kairos, I had to, to, to work with young students and also university, those who are at the universities, to work with communities and you know to get what we are calling the tools for reconciliation. How can we get rid of violence and open conflict? Because solution of problems is not always, um, we don't also have to fight when we have issues. Problems give us opportunity to seek, to reconcile and to build. And that opportunity was given to us through the work of Kairos and many young people, many uh, young people and uh, Christian and faith communities in Africa got what they needed through the work of Kairos. I think uh, this is what I got from the brilliant pre presentation and now uh, I will continue and um, to specify and to thank the new staff and team in Kairos to continue in the same direction because a lot is still in our hand. You know, COP20 uh, something is around and uh, things are happening in their own way, but we have our voice and the voice of the majority. We are not the marginalized, but we are the one who will bring the change. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, Georgine, and uh, especially for the, that word of encouragement as we as we move forward. I'd like to move on to our, our second responder, Joe Gunn. He grew up in Toronto where he received his BA in political science. 
followed by an MA from the University of Regina. For seven years, Joe worked in Central American refugee camps and then development projects in Nicaragua. Returning to Canada, he served for a decade as chair of the Interchurch Committee on Human Rights in Latin America and has been involved in, in many coalitions that have um, that were part of the formation of Kairos. And so we'd like to invite Joe to speak now. So anyway, thanks everyone. I'm joining you from the unceded and surrendered territory of the Algonquin people here in Ottawa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have only a few minutes, so I'm gonna make five points, uh, which are really uh, in a privileged position to do after listening to such great speakers. And these points can almost be summarized by uh, the people that have spoken before. So I think that Ivan, uh, muchas gracias Ivan por lo que usted nos señaló. Uh, not only Thank the great- Ivan for what you said. And been mentioned as well by Georgina, but also the fact that one of the key things that the establishment of Kairos did was uh, when Kairos was established, it was not just bringing any number of coalitions together. It was also looking at what was the particular moment, what was the social analysis, what was, what was the ecological analysis, what was the ecclesial analysis. And we realized that there was no coalition specifically directed to doing work on environmental justice. And so the work that Yvonne brought to our mind about the carbon Sabbath work uh, and learning from the Global South about how we could be in solidarity, a greater solidarity with uh, what Georgina called extractivism in the Global South. This was, this was really key and this was done uh, as we established uh, Kairos 20 years ago. And that story should be written up. It would be a fascinating story to see that. But nonetheless fascinating uh, would be to highlight uh, Priscilla's remarkable story to us. Uh, I was one of these fellows who came to work in Ottawa in the, in the mid nineties and became chair of what was called the Aboriginal Rights Coalition. Uh, why was one of the reasons why Kairos was established when I started work with the Aboriginal Rights Coalition as on the board, it was $25,000 in debt and in danger of closing. And some of the coalitions were doing very well, thank you very much, and some weren't. Now, if you were to look at Kairos today and the amount of staff and uh, work and participation and so on that happens in Aboriginal just, Indigenous justice work today, you see a huge difference from those days. Uh, we lived through the time of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, as it was called. Their report was called Gathering Strength, but most of us referred to it as Gathering Dust. And I think there's a wonderful story that uh, Priscilla alerted us to the shift that Kairos was able to uh, really push among the churches, the shift to really take on Indigenous rights in a serious and helpful uh, and a new way. The, the establishment of the Kairos blanket exercise, uh, it happened before Kairos existed, but it really developed. It didn't, it didn't remain as, uh, as a tool from the, uh, we, we, we developed it after the, the period of the Royal Commission, but it's really so much different. And it's, of course, it's Indigenous led. So this is a story that could be, that could be written up and shared, I think, in great, great detail and, and point to many, many uh, lessons for us. Um, Georgina also mentioned the, the question of extractivism. When did, the, when did our churches uh, and when did our ecumenical organization, Kairos, really take this seriously? What a terrific story it would be to look at that today. Uh, I can remember being on the Kairos board when we were having a great debate about uh, which delegation we would send to which part of Africa to study extractivism. Uh, and you might guess that the, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, people uh, who had developed, you know, had development projects for years and years in places like the Congo and uh, French speaking parts of Africa were suggesting partners there and our Protestant 
uh, church organizations who are also part of the board were suggesting all kinds of other countries where extractivism was rampant. And this conversation and debate were on about where should we go and where could we have impact? And I made the fateful suggestion that we might look at Northern Alberta before we send a delegation overseas. And we may have rude the day because of the response of the, the Harper government and the whole campaign that, uh, that caused uh, Cairo some grief and losing funding and so on. But all those developments are really, really worthwhile. Uh, Georgina raised the issue of not only did Cairo look at extractivism, but a gendered analysis of how uh, extractivism was impacting people. And uh, this, of course, was, was not done uh, before Kairos was, uh, was, was constructed. I want to end with just one uh, final comment. There's so much more to be able to be said. Uh, Lee's point of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a chapter in a, in a book I produced on Journeys to Justice called where uh, Jennifer Henry re reports eloquently on how the Canadian Ecumenical Jubilee Initiative created the possibility for us to dream of a Kairos because we worked on the debt cancellation campaigns for three years together and 30 people would gather around the table in Toronto and that even the staff like the two Johns went down to Montreal and talked to colleagues in Quebec. It really set a frame, a new frame for the possibility of uh, Kairos. And so the amazing work that Lee was involved in others and three or four volumes of theological reflections at that time are things that you can go back and read as well as Jennifer's uh, essay about that. But to end, let me say that the theme of today's conversation is where have we come from? And I think the answer very generally to that is we've come from traditions of people and traditions of faith communities who are unafraid to change. As people of faith, we're not museum curators, we're adventure guides, or should be. So it's not, not just a question of responding and remembering our past and knowing all the details of these wonderful stories. It's really a question of saying, this is a good way to live out our lives of faith. Uh, Post-pandemic, things are going to be different. Residential school legacies, the churches and our work is going to be different. Kairos is now in what the former mayor of Calgary called a wet clay moment. We have a chance to mold something new once again, such as we had 20 years ago. How are we going to live up to that? People like David Frimmer, the wonderful Lutheran leader who was part of the original uh, the coalitions and then part of the Kairos, initial Kairos board, talks about public multi-faithism, a new ecumenical movement, the need to look at a new theological narrative for Canada and to, in this moment of disestablishment of the traditional Christian churches, to move actually towards a, a brand new interfaith way of working in the future, a new way of believing, thinking, and acting theologically to remove our kind of populist or triumphalist tendencies and to be open. There's one last story I'll share. Uh, two months ago, we had a lovely thousand people participated with the three commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission looking at how we could push issues forward in Canada. Marie Wilson, one of the commissioners was asked, how do you keep faith alive? How do you keep hope alive? And she said, the point of this is to realize that this work changes all of us. So I wanna thank everybody who's participating in this, uh, in this call, in this Zoom meeting, because this work has changed all of us in many ways and those experiences are worth sharing and holding dear. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for, for those concluding words. Uh, I think that uh, 
that wrapped up this, this time that we've had together really, really well. I know that so many of you could continue to share your stories and, and I would love to hear more. It's been so inspiring to, to listen to, to each voice that, uh, that has been offered today. And uh, I know I, I feel very enriched by, by hearing these connections and, um, and, and a sense of, of grounding in, in the work that has been, been done. And, uh, and I think that grounding is what holds us and, and what, uh, what gives us strength as we move forward. So uh, thank you everyone. And um, it was an honor to, to be with you and to share in this time today. So I'd like to uh, pass things back over to Aisha for uh, the, next, um, the next portion. Thank you so very much. What a wonderful introduction to this uh, 20th anniversary. I am going to invite Adriana to come back to the stage and share with us what she has been creating during this time. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to share my screen. I began with this image of um, working together over 20 years and maybe even before, uh, maybe the, the, the stories and the, the connections that made possible for Kairos to begin as an organization. Um, and the image radiates from the middle, but it also um, I see it as coming from all the edges from all around the world um, to that center image of uh, the connection that um, that brings us all uh, here today to this celebration. Um, on the left side um, with the feather, just a reminder of some of the words that Barbara shared with us around the importance of love, hope and community um, of coming together at the right time. Um, the Kairos time and the, the work that, that drives or the, the force that drives this work around the, the desire for justice and dignity for all beings around the world. So moving beyond centering humans into understanding our interconnection as uh, members of this large ecosystem and this planet. Um, and also, the reminder that this is an ongoing journey, um, that it is um, something that will continue beyond, beyond, um, and, and it ripples out. And also um, the invitation of both recognizing and celebrating the successes, uh, recognizing the challenges and renewing the commitment to justice um, and Georgine, uh, invited us to think about the strong foundation that has allowed this work to, to be there and celebrate that because it is what will allow what comes after. Um, and I am going to have lift off the, also the words around um, living faith um, and afraid of change, knowing that change is part of, of the transformation and change is part of what keeps us, um, what keeps work relevant. Um, and also um, uplifting Priscilla's words around um, the importance of self-reflection, of, of not being afraid of speaking about the things that need to change within organizations, uh, within working relationships and within um, the structures um, by, by being able to address those, those things that are not fully working um, and, and knowing that renewal needs to happen is what keeps uh, things moving forward. Um, and, and uplifting some of Yvonne, Yvonne, Yvonne's words. For me, it has always been essential as an immigrant to, to not lose sight of the connection between North and South. And that is something that I uplift a lot about the work that Kairos does, uh, the respect, um, and bringing forward the voices of people from around the world that Georgina also made reference to, and, um, and realizing that um, as a global community, we are inter interconnected. And so what happens here or the impact of the actions of countries that have been being developed um, in what is called, I, 
I think a bit wrongly the developing world, um, those connections and recognizing the impact um, it's essential in, in, in also that fight for justice. Um, so this drawing is still kind of in the works. <laughs> I'll be adding more details and um, fixing up some of the, the writing, but, um, but I hope it's very useful in, in, in what is to come. And I'm super excited to, to join tomorrow to, to be part of the next conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Adriana. That is wonderful. And so what a, what a morning. This has been absolutely incredible. And I think that what we are seeing um, and what we heard today was a lot about the foundation, the framework and the fruit of Kairos to this moment. You know, we, we had a wonderful um, journey of understanding where Kairos came from and how it was established and why this work is so important and all of those people who have been a part of Kairos. And so there are so many people to thank and to congratulate for the work and for where we are now celebrating 20 years. I wanted to thank all of the panelists who spoke today and the responders and the moderator. Thank you so much for what you brought today and for launching our 20th anniversary celebrations and gathering. Um, there's much for us to consider, and I look forward to day two and day three, where we get to talk about now, what is happening now, because the reality is that we are living in a very different world. We are going through uh, a few different pandemics, and um, as we respond to that, what are we facing now and how are we responding to the work in this moment? And then on day three, the opportunity for us to envision, how do we continue this work? As some of our panelists suggested this morning, there's some really phenomenal ways of doing the work, but then also a need for us to consider what is new and what is innovative and what is different about how we approach the work. So thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Um, I believe truly that Kairos is the realization of our shared values and commitment. And that is an incredibly, incredibly powerful mechanism or causative agent for change. And we see that. We see that it's happened and we see that it will continue to happen. Kairos is committed. And we invite you to remain committed in our collective work for human rights and ecological justice. And one of the ways that that can happen is by um, participating with us in the way of being a monthly donor. Uh, the team will share more information about this through all of the different channels of communication that will be coming out. So if you are interested, please um, be a part of the work that we're doing in all of the possible ways that you can be. And so we thank you for being here. We are so incredibly honored to be celebrating this 20th anniversary moment with all of you. And thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. <laughs>